Okay, welcome, and we're doing our annual Easter message, and uh, it's good to have you with us, and those of you that are here, to try to explore a little bit about this day, which is, as we know, Easter. Al, um, uh, uh, I just saw something that needs to be done. Can you just go over, stand in that chair, and flip that light on? We have a no, the spotlight that has to be put on. That's fine. Um, this is always to me a. It should be a time of great celebration. For the animals, it is, and for the trees and for nature, it is. But I've been turning the television on, and there's been movies, you know, Hollywood produced movies, and Christian programs. But what I have seen most graphically is this man with nails driven through his body, impaled on a cross. And I always turn it off. It goes against me terribly. I, and I always stop and I say to God, what's wrong with you? I mean, is, if this is your idea and this is your will, then I'd have to reach the conclusion that your perversion is as equal with the people who did it. In fact, the people who did it, according to the, your book, are doing your will. And that's all I saw. This horror, and then I watched people in different religious faiths having their ceremonies, and they were carrying this cross up the street. Man, they were carrying it. Do you realize that if this event took place in this age, that people would be celebrating the holiday carrying electric chairs up the street? They would. That's exactly what they'd hear. You get one, and I'll go, who's got the wire? Yeah. Yeah, forget. Then I thought, you know, I look at the world and look at the condition of it. You live in an extremely violent society. Not only is this society violent, the entire world is violent. Why? But I thought of the old axiom, like father, like son. If there is a God, and it's God's pleasure to act violently in order to somehow find a way of forgiving you, and what's to be expected of the people who follow? And basically, that's what I saw demonstrated. Now, I had a lot of trouble with it. I always have had a lot of trouble with it. To me, it's, a, it's an amazing misinterpretation of Eastern allegory that our religions have constructed this story of a man being impaled with nails on this, on this cross. And, and, and then it comes down into this day. This becomes a great day because the same man who is slaughtered by the will of the Creator in this most horrible fashion, a couple days later, gets out of the grave. And I said, for what? What's the purpose of it? To prove what? I mean, if it's God, so what's the big deal? And so then, you know, you spend, my mind spends reams of time trying to make sense as to, has this done anything good for anybody? The world is an absolute disaster. It's always been a disaster. An extremely violent place of wars and bombs and greed. Because this whole thing is a religious instance of greed in which people are clinging to this so that they can get something out of it. They want to go to heaven. You know, wreck this and go some, to some planet somewhere. It's all greed. I am coming here. And somebody said that they went and drove by the churches and there's lines of people lined up out there. And do you know why? Because there's a threat. If they don't go, they won't get. And so they go, even if they only show up this one time all year, 
they figure that kind of wipes the slate clean until next year, and they'll get this free ride to this mystery, this magical planet somewhere that they're going to find in what's called heaven. It's all great. And basically, if you could only wash out all of this threatening, all of this going to heaven, all of this nonsense about heaven and hell, and all of these things, and then the entire world just live in the flow of the existence of what nature is and life is, then you'd finally come to a conclusion. Hey, now I understand. Now, now maybe I can just flow with it. But it's competitive. Competition. Competition. Everybody competing with everybody. Religions competing with everybody, with each other. Countries competing with each other. And then the violence starts. And then your kids compete with each other. You can't even raise your kids without sending them to a football league or a baseball league so they can compete with somebody so they can learn the art of beating up the other person. Winning. It's not the art of existing, coexisting. It's the art of beating the other person. It's not good unless we win. And that's exactly where all of this stuff comes from. Religion teaches us this. Systems teach us this, to be competitive. And generally, somebody's going to lose. And the loser gets ticked off. And the loser will get you one way or the other. That's always the way it is. And so we see it. So we celebrate. I, since I've been a little kid... They've been parading down Fifth Avenue in their Easter bonnets with all the frills upon it, and Bing Crosby would sing songs, and they have flowers like this, and everybody, and in between, they're always, I've never seen them stop dropping the bombs or stop shooting the guns or hating and all this kind of stuff. So then, we come to the point is, what the heck, where did that come from? You know, what's the origin of that? Why, you know, why are you here even, why, why are there flowers here? Why are you celebrating such a thing? Why is there such a thing called Easter? And I'll tell you why, and this is the reason. There is a need. And what is the need? The Christian community had a need to pull you as far away as possible from this Jewish thing called Passover. That's the only reason there is such a day as Easter, because it was absolutely essential that you be pulled away from this Jewish thing called Passover. There was no other reason. There was a need. It's too. It, 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 basically, you're in your entire religion, the religion of your heritage, which is called Christianity, is 100% anti-Semitic. Always has been. And the first thing they said about was changing this over from the Jewish Passover to this called Easter. And the second thing they said about when they got organized was organizing their armies to go out and kill Jews. Basically, that's, that's the basis, that's the foundation of your religion. Even though your quote-unquote Messiah, Yeshua, is very, very Jewish. So we even did that. We couldn't deal with that. So we took that Jeheshua or Yeshua, whatever, and changed it to the Greek Jesus. And now we, the complete uh, changeover is... No more Yeshua, no more Jewish, no more Passover. Now we got a Greek by the name of Jesus, and we got Easter. You see it? Very, very cleverly done. And you went, you bought the whole thing. Hook, line, and sinker, you bought the whole thing. <laughs> Come in, sang songs about it, say we're all saved, after some characters had just totally shifted the whole thing, changed everything that was the basis of the religion, made it into a, a, a festival, of, and you bought it. And even Ben Crosby, yeah. We'll replace uh, you know, the, the hymn of Bing Crosby sings in your Easter bonnet. And, and whatever the mob does, you see, this is the problem. Whatever the mob does, you buy it. See, the mob goes, we'll follow them. We don't become individuals. So, the day is Easter. It evolves out of this need to get rid of the Jewish Passover. We take this Jesus. He evolves out of the need to get rid of the Jewish Yeshua. And now our anti-Semitic separation is complete. And we all run off and say, well, we've done this, and, you know, this is wonderful, we're all Christians. Now there's a problem with it. Let's take, if you would, this thing called Passover here. Okay. And we'll look at it, and then we'll compare it with our beloved Easter day. I'd like you to turn to page 125 in the Bible. You'll come to the book of Numbers and the book of Numbers chapter 9 for those of you um, 
out there. Numbers chapter 9. And uh, let's, let's take a look and see. You, you, you've got to have some authority. I've got to have some authority. I've tried in every, every time I've ever met with you to document for you where I find this stuff, to document for you where you can find it, because a lot of you hear things from me and say, well, gee, I don't know whether he made this up or whatever, and that's not good. You have to be able to go to a library or a bookstore or something and say, where does this come from? You know, it should be interesting to you. All of this should be interesting to you because you live in, in the midst of all this. So where does it come from? So then I tell you, okay, let's, let's, let's see if we can get some documentation. Let's draw a line down here. All right? And let's look at the Bible. Now, here's another thing. In all of the things I've ever seen, wherever Christians and, you know, go to church, they always have a Bible. It doesn't make any difference. It's a Bible. You have them here. You can go in any church, any Christian church, they have a Bible. So what we'll look at is what's in here. What else are we going to do? You know, where are we going to find any documentation? I don't know where. So we'll look in here. Page 125, Numbers chapter 9, look at verse 2. Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. Very important of the word season. Because what you're involved in right now is a Passover from one season to another. Is basically what this is. Let the children of Israel keep what? The Passover. Okay. Numbers chapter 9, verse 2. Look at Numbers chapter 9, verse 4. Two scriptures down. And Moses spoke unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. So this here, then, is a biblical ordinance that is approved, obviously, by God, if God had anything to do with writing the Bible, which of course is, <laughs> which is another question. We'll get some other time. But anyhow, this is approved by God, the Passover. And in, in as much as we carry Bibles under our arm, you know, we even write songs. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. And we have children, we have Bible stories and Bible studies. So you just read in the book that according to God and according to this Bible, we keep the Passover. Okay, so people go. Now there's another day. There's another day. This day, according to this same Bible, is condemned by the same God. Bad. <laughs> okay. It involves a strange God, and the strange God's name is Tammuz. Tammuz. And we're just looking, we're, we're looking here at mythological things, and it's not necessarily bad in the context of what it really was, but it's bad in the context of what we're talking about uh, spiritual. This Tammuz had a spouse. Tammuz's spouse's name was I-S-H-T-A-R, pronounced Easter. Ishtar. You pronounce it Ishtar, they pronounced it Easter. Okay. This was the deal. Tammuz would sacrifice his life for the good of the world. He would then go into the netherworld, and every spring, at the spring equinox, Tammuz would be raised by Ishtar, who would go down and bring him up in a gray-colored egg. And he would come out of the gray-colored egg. For 40 days prior to this resurrection of Tammuz, the women would put ashes on their head, and it was called Count 40. 40 days. Nowadays, you call it Lent. On the day of the resurrection, of Tammuz, the people would go down to the sea or to the ocean and worship the sun. Nowadays you call it the sunrise service. All right. This is what went on. Look at that. You know, this is a dangerous thing. I am constantly getting cut on this thing. Where did I get a new one here? I thought, what is that warm thing I feel trickling down here? I would, you know, I went banging into this. This has got sharp corners. Who made this thing? That's a sign you're getting old because your skin is getting thinner. 
Oh, thanks. <laughs> nice to know on Resurrection Day. Okay. Anyhow, let's take a look at this experience with Tammuz, the Count 40 of Lent, the sun, and so forth. Go to page 683 in the Bible. Uh, you'll be at Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8, page 683. All right. Look at verse 13. He says, Turn again, and you shall see greater abominations. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. That's very important. The gate of the Lord's house towards the north is the seat of the emotions. And look what you see. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. There's our boy. Right there. And remember, and you, and what I want you to do, go to the library, get on your computer, wherever you go, go to your encyclopedia, look up Easter, and you'll run right into Tammuz and Easter. Because that's the story. And the women weeping was, they threw ashes on their head, and that was called count 40, and was 40 days before the resurrection. Then look what it says in verse 15. Look, look at this, turn again and see greater abominations. And he brought me, verse 16, to the inner court, and at the door of the temple between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worshiped the sun. That's the origin of the sunrise service. That's the origin of Lent. Tammuz is a consort, of, a consort or, or, or spouse of Ishtar. And, that, and you know what they used to do in Babylon? The women on this beautiful day would all show up at church and they would act as sexual objects. They would be prostitutes in the day. The only thing that women were required to wear were their Easter bonnets. That was it. <laughs> The temples were filled with chicks and bunnies and eggs because it was fertility. There was no problem. There was no, this was not what you're thinking. This wasn't, uh, you know, something like on 42nd Street. This was a great holy day of creation. I mean, all, all of, all of, of, of your, your, your biblical and all of your ancient uh, scriptures are based around the sexual act. It was very, very important, the phallic worship and all of these types of things. And this was part of it. Thing. But according to the Bible, and I can only go by what we have here, is according to the Bible that what we just read, this God who approved this condemns this. And you just saw it. So now the decision is to be made. Here we have the people that have formulated the foundation of your religion. Here we have the people that have built your church. Here we have the people that have built your tradition. They have to make a decision. The church has to select between the Passover, which is approved by God and Moses, or Ishtar, which is condemned by God and is sexual fertility. And the church makes a decision. It is exactly the same as what you read at the time of the crucifixion. Give us Barabbas. Because the church said, we'll take Easter. The hell with that. And you know what? You bought it. Hook, line, and stinker, you bought it. Say, yeah, this is our day. This is our holy day. You took this? Say, even though the Bible condemns it, you still can't deal with it. Everybody still has to say, oh, this is it. Because it's a cheap way to have a party to go out and have something to eat. You're forced to go see some relative and sit and eat with that relative that you don't even like. <laughs> Where is it in the Bible? It's not. You have a Bible. The only word Easter in the Bible is a mistranslation of the word Pascha, which is Passover. It's in the New Testament. It's not anywhere else in the book. It only talks about this. You bought this. And yet they'll go around and say, this is the word of God. Jerry Fowler, will, this is God's holy word. And all the other preachers, with Oral Roberts and the Pope will say, this is God's word. It cannot be changed. But they brought this. And they refuted that. 
Now, basically, no matter how you look, no matter how you try, you cannot deny this. This is a fact. Okay. This is a day of sex, prostitution, sexual intercourse in public, chicks, bunnies, and eggs, all our fertility signs. This was a fertility cult, and this is your holy day. So maybe, <laughs> maybe that kind of shows you where we're at. And maybe that's okay, but at least understand it. Don't come around with a Bible that's old. And in fact, you come around with this holy word of God and say, you know, the Bible told me so, and, all, and then this is the day, and you totally wipe this thing. Anyhow, we're going to wipe this out for now. now. Let's go on for a minute. There's a horrible mistake made here that has impacted you, has impacted your children, has impacted everybody you know, has impacted the world. Turning away from this and turning to Easter, we have brought plagues, sickness, and all kinds of hell upon ourselves and our children. Okay. The Passover was ordained for the March-April equinox, spring equinox, because it is cosmic in nature. It marks the passing of winter to spring. In this particular age that we're in, it's marking the passing of Pisces to Aquarius. This is the bigger picture. This is the smaller picture. In you, Passover marks the movement from the left side to the right side, from the carnal to the spirit. And we refuted it. We missed it. Okay. It's exactly what it is. In the great cosmic order, it goes from Pisces to Aquarius, the Passover. It's what Jesus was talking about. I will celebrate the Passover when you see the man with the pitcher of water, the movement from Pisces to Aquarius. That's the cosmic universal Passover. This is the earthly Passover from winter to spring, and this is the Passover which you must follow within yourself from the left to the right, from the carnal to the spirit. And we missed the whole doggone thing because we wanted bunnies and chickens and eggs and hats and sex. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. What happens then is the sun would rise from the south. Don't you see? Look, when you look on television and you see this man with nails in his hands and feet and the blood running out and all his horror, understand something. This is a dramatization of an astronomical fact. On December the 21st, the sun, God's light, enters a constellation located in the south called the Southern Cross or Crooks. Every December the 21st, the sun enters that cross and is crucified. Now, if, if the sun on December the 21st entered the constellation Taurus the Bull, there would be no man on a cross. There would be a man gored by a bull. Serious. Because the man on the cross is simply acting out an astronomical fact. If it was Taurus, he would have been gored by a bull. Okay? What happens to the sun then, on December the 22nd and 23rd and 24th, that's called the winter solstice. After being crucified on December the 21st, the sun is entombed in the bowels of the earth for three days and three nights. On December the 25th, by the trajectory of the earth, the sun is born again and starts its northward trek. This is what it's all about. But instead of understanding the natural astronomical fact that's involved here, we created a story and we literally took a man and we, and our, we, we how can, what do you do with little children? You got little children sitting in here and you've taken your little children to the holy experience to see God's will and a man tortured to death naked on a cross with nails in them. And you wonder why they grow up neurotic like us because we all went through that story. And because if this is God that would do that, what chance have you got? Until you come to understand 
we took, which was an astronomical allegory. We made up a story of it. Here's the cross, December 21st. Here's the three days and three nights in the tomb. Here's the resurrection. Then that sun trajectorizes. It moves up to the north. It then becomes the lamb because it embraces Aries, the lamb. It moves then to the northern hemisphere, to the right side where it sits, and summer comes to the world. New life springs up. That's the Passover. That's the crucifixion. That's the entombment. That's the resurrection. That's the Lamb. And that's sitting at the right hand of the Father. All of this is nature. But we've constructed this, this, this death orgy. And we, we treat our children, oh, look it. Look what happened. Is this wonderful? I never thought it wonderful. I always thought God was sick. What the heck is the matter with you? You're going to forgive me for eating a hot dog on Friday by killing this guy? What's this guy ever do? And if that's the way you solve your problems, no wonder the way we solve our problems. But he didn't. This is the burnt offering. You know, one of the sickest things, you know, the second sickest thing I used to have with the Bible, people gave me the Bible to read. And I, the first Bible everybody, but ever, anybody ever gave me, I read it from cover to cover. And I got sick. Not only with this, but you know what the big deal was? This God wouldn't be nice to anybody unless they took an animal, killed it, and burnt it in his temple. I said, what is it? I didn't want any part of it. I'd rather join another religion because I don't like that. How many animals, you know, the suffering and, and all of this and people, uh, and I said, this is awful. The burnt offering. Why do you have to burn something? Why not peanut butter? Why not Oreos? What is this burning? What is with you? You're sick. Yeah. I, said, I used to talk to God. I said, what's up? You're something with your head. I mean, I know there's something with my head, but now I know why. Because I came from you. Because you're sick. Yeah, then I started to understand the burnt offering. The sun is the fire. And the sun consumes the lamb, Aries, and the burnt offering. Then it sits here, and summer comes to the world. We took it literally. Am I the only one? I said, I found it out. I become enlightened. I realized it was never intended that we believe that animals should be burned. Never intended. And then one day I found a remote passage in the scriptures. And I breathed a great sigh of relief. Whew. Maybe I can stay with this. Maybe I can start to break the code. Maybe, look with me. Go to page 483. Page 483. And I'll never forget the day that I found this because I love animals and I felt so good about this. Page 483. Here is David talking, one of the Bible writers, one of the Bible scholars. And look what he says in Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears have you opened, burnt offerings and sin offering have you not required. He found it too. He became enlightened. David became enlightened. Wow, he said, you didn't, this wasn't what you meant. We weren't supposed to kill animals and burn them. You didn't mean that. The animal that you want to kill is the animal in here. And the burnt offering is that which is the energy of the solar plexus, which is the fire in the flesh here to move up to, take that which is the pineal gland of the brain, which is the Aries there, then the right side will open and summertime will come to my life. That's what you meant. And then I saw David say, my ears have you opened. All of this stuff we've been killing in blood is not what you wanted. Is not what you required. Is that acting up there? Oh, yeah, go. Okay. Wow, that, that I really... Then look at, look at uh, page 541. It's um, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 6. 
And this is the reason that the priests and we have erred for so long to understand a proverb, the interpretation, the words and the wise and the dark sayings. And these are the dark sayings. These are the dark sayings we never understood. You know what? I want to show you something that's interesting. Look at, uh, look at Isaiah chapter 1. I didn't include this in the notes that I have. Somebody tell me what page Isaiah chapter 1 is in those little Bibles because I'd like you to see something, okay? I want, you, I want you to see something interesting because this burnt offering and animal killing went on for a long time. But look here, if you would. Page 579. Look there. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, page 579, because I want to show you something. Look at verse 11, chapter 1, verse 11. This is a comment about animal sacrifice. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bulls or of goats or lambs. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my... Who told you to do this? Where the heck did you get the idea that I like to have bulls and bats and all of this stuff fried up on a pan in church? Who told you such crap like this? Bring no more oblations. It's an abomination to me. Get away with it. It's an inequity. And then he says in verse 15, and because of this, when you spread forth your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I will not hear because your hands are full of blood. Full of blood of what? Of this thing that many in religion today still think you have the right to dominate animals. And you have not the right to hurt animals. You have not the right to dominate animals. The animal nature that's supposed to be dominated by you is the animal nature within yourself, not the four-layer. And so that really made me feel good. And so then I could come back and I started to understand, hey, if David finally became enlightened and he realized that this sacrifice was not required, then what are we understanding this? Don't we understand that a blood sacrifice of a human being is not required and that the, that the, that the requirement is an, is an astrological requirement allegorically portrayed? The solstice, the, the, the sun going through the cross and, and moving up to Aries, then it starts to make, it starts to make sense we understand it. Wow! If David became enlightened and he understood he didn't have to kill an animal, we should be enlightened and understand we don't have to kill a man. And then I picked up the Gospel of Thomas, which the church did not allow to be put in the Bible. And in the Gospel of Thomas, John says he looks at the cross, he sees the crucifixion, he can't stand it, it's disgusting. He runs up, enters into a cave, and Jesus is standing there laughing. And Jesus says, the things that they say I suffered, I didn't. And John walks out and he says, I realize that God did all of this symbolically to save me. And what was that all about? What that was about is when you look with the carnal mind at the cross, you're going to see a man naked bleeding to death. But when you climb that pathway up into the cave with a higher consciousness, then you'll meet the Christ. Then you'll see that which is the cross of light. And then you'll understand that this astronomical fact is the cross upon which all of us must rest and be saved. And all of that is available to you. But don't forget, you only see the books in that Bible that the church wanted you to see. That, that Bible was not put... You know, how that, you know how they selected the books? That when the Catholic Church, they put them on the floor. And they locked the door and they said, we'll pray. And the next, when we come in tomorrow morning, whatever books are up on the table, that's the books. But they never said who had the key. Who had the key? Because the next morning they come up and they had all these books... And then Martin Luther came along and well, I don't like some of these books, I'm going to throw these out. So the Catholics still have their Bible with their books, you have this Bible with these books, and some of the books are out, and there's thousands of books that you've never seen which are not allowed to be read by you. And one of them is the Gospel of Thomas, in which, G in which John says that the, that the crucifixion was symbolic to save you. And that Jesus stood in the cave saying, the things that they say I suffered, I never suffered. Read it for yourself. Look at it for yourself. Understand it for yourself. You talk about brainwashing. This is a great joke, you know. People in Russia were brainwashed, and people in communist China were brainwashed. And look what we got. This is our great holy day. We bought it hook, line, and say, we honestly believe this. Well, Jesus being the sun god. And what happens? Let me ask you a question. Here's the sun. What happens when the sun dies? What happens when the sun goes out? There's darkness. There's an eclipse. Go to page 807 in the Bible. Matthew chapter 27, okay? 
Here's the crucifixion of Jesus. Matthew chapter 27. Look at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, the number six means that which is works, that which is of the lower mind, until the ninth hour, that which is uh, uh, the higher mind. From the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Sure, the sun is killed. The sun dies and there's an eclipse. There's darkness all over the earth. You know how hard it is for people not to believe that there's a God somewhere that would slaughter this man? Do you know how hard it is not to believe that? Do you know how hard? But do, what you do, what you do when you fail to understand that which is within you, when you fail to understand that which is nature, when you can look astronomically and see this thing moving. And so the sun sits at the right hand of power. All things become new. But see, take all of that astronomically. Now this is not going to be too good because I'm not very good of an artist. But there you are. Okay. The reason. Down here in the solar plexus is the fire. Okay. The crucifixion is when you then take those five senses. Sight, taste, touch, smell, feeling. And you crucify them. You shut them down. When you do that, this energy comes in a serpentine fashion up the spine. It's an electrical energy. Just like that, just like you see in the caduceus, just like you see in DNA. And it comes right up here, and it impacts a gland in the middle of your brain called the pineal gland of the brain. When that occurs, it throws open the right hemisphere of the brain. That's the same way that the sun, when it moves upward in its trajectory, impacts Aries the lamb, and then it throws open itself to the right hemisphere or to the eastern sky. In the northern hemisphere, it sits at the east. When you get to the northern hemisphere of your brain, that energy then sits at the east, which is the right side. Then all newness comes. Do you understand? You're having spring now. Look at the grass. Look at the buds on the trees. Look at the flowers are starting to come up. None of this could happen unless the sun is crucified, sits in the tomb of the winter solstice, is born on December the 25th, rises upward, and impacts, the, uh, impacts that which is Aries the Lamb. In your life, the winter of your life, the cold of your life, that which is the terror of your life, that cannot give way until that energy rises itself up to the pineal gland and throws open the right hemisphere of the brain. It can't happen any other way. You can pray all you want. You can read all the books that you want. So what did we choose? This ask, I'll ask you now, what did we choose? Did we choose the Passover? Did we choose that which is, a, which is an astronomical fact? Did we choose that which is a, is, a, is a fact of the season? Did we choose that which is the fact of consciousness? No, you choose bunnies and eggs and, and flowers and all of that stuff. With Passover, you have new life, you have new understanding, you have new beginnings, you have warmth, you have color because you have, a, you have an astronomical fact. With Easter, you have bunnies and chicks. And our religion has totally ne neglected nature. We built stone buildings, we built stone statues, we wrote books, we rang songs, we made rules and regulations, and then we went inside of these buildings, we sang the songs, we read the books, we played the plays, and we, did, and we paid no attention to nature. And we miss the whole thing. And so what do you do? You become tough, and you fight, and you compete, and you drop bombs on one another, and they kill one another, and they rape one another, and the kids and all of this to take drugs. Who wouldn't take drugs? This is what you're taught. I mean, who wouldn't? What chance do you have? If your God is a lunatic, what chance do we have? And all that sits in the subconscious, you're supposed to be gentle. You're supposed to be forgiving. But what does it mean your God is not gentle and forgiving unless he kills people? So we closed ourselves in and we become very arrogant with nature. And we fight with nature. And when we fight with nature, we fight with ourselves. And we have to learn that our Bible is a great lesson written in dark sayings of our part with nature. That's what it is. We have to meditate so that we flow with this nature. You have to come close to the trees. You have to come close to the harmony. There's an ancient story. I want you to tell it to you real quick. Nobody even knows who wrote this story. Darkness comes to God. And darkness says to God, I've got a complaint. God says, what is it? He says, look, I've never done anything to the sun. Never but I spend my entire life running, hiding from it. What does it have against me? 
Why am I tortured like this? I constantly have to run because the sun will not leave me alone, and I don't have anything to do with the sun. God says, hey, it's a good complaint. So God calls the sun. He says, son, uh, you want to come up and see me? And the sun comes in. So why are you bothering darkness? I mean, what did darkness ever do to you? And the sun says, what are you talking about? What's darkness? I never met anything called darkness. I never heard of anything called darkness. And God turned around and looked, and darkness was gone. Because the sun was there. So the sun says, if you can bring darkness to me, I'll, I'll apologize. See, sometimes God brings darkness. It's like time, there's storms. Sometimes God brings the sun. But he can never bring them together. Did you ever notice that? He can never, it is impossible for God to bring darkness and the sun together at the same time. The reason is darkness has no existence. It's simply the absence of the sun. It's simply the absence of light. So there can be no such thing. There is no such thing as darkness when the sun is present. And yet we have lived our life. Do you know what the origin of your Christian religion was called by history when it flourished in the Middle Ages? You know what it was called? The Dark Ages. Nobody was allowed to think. Nobody was allowed to... I don't care whether you believe me. I don't care whether you get mad at this stuff. It's irrelevant. Get mad. Don't believe me. Argue about it. But at least think. You haven't been able to think all your life. You go to church. You sing Amazing Grace. I walk in the garden alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's all true. Here, throw the money in. And Nobody questions. Just think. Question. Look. Read. Open books. Study. Let your children question. Let your children look. Look with them. If I'm wrong, so who cares? At least you th begin to think. Your children begin to think. And if you begin to think, and if you begin to question, and if you begin to look, one day you'll find truth. And you begin to understand. But if you sit in the darkness of the tradition of your teachings, there'll never be any light. You'll and this is the whole inference. The inference is you must take the sun and the sun must rise up into that place of the mind. The sun must rise up into that place of the mind. You can't let, and you know, I'll tell you something. Those of you who have sat in the sun, those of you who have sat in the light of these teachings, you can't even sit and watch that stuff on television anymore. You can't possibly even understand what the heck they're even talking about. How you sit and you watch this, and God Almighty say, how do we get to them? How do we get to them? Now you say, well, maybe you're not, a, well, wonder if this Wonder if this is right in the entire world. Is it right? Look, you know what Jesus Christ says? Wisdom is known by her children. Wisdom is known by her children. Do you think it's right that teenage suicide is the second leading killer of teenagers? Is this, is this a compliment to our Bible? You got a church on every street corner. You got evangelists all over a television. And you need a drug outreach center in every community in the United States. Is this good? Obviously not. So what's wrong? What I showed you this morning is that the Bible that you cherish, the God that you cherish said you should take and understand Passover. But she's refuted it because the people that you follow eliminated Passover and constructed this thing out of mythology of Babylon called Easter. And that's what you selected. And that's what you went with. And you never questioned it. You never ever say, wait a minute, it says here Passover. Where'd you get this from? Nobody ever questions it because you don't question the leaders. They say it, we march. We're going to war, nobody questions. If you question it, you're considered a traitor. Exactly the same in religion. If you question them, you're considered a traitor. They throw you out. You can't question, and that's what you've got to do. So, Jehoshua, Jesus, was he a superman? He walked on water. Can you walk on water? He couldn't either. He couldn't either. He stood on the truth. And he said, the things that I do, you can do, you can do better. That's how I know he didn't walk on water, because I can't walk on water, because I try. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what he said to me? He said, the things that I do, you can do, you can do better than me. 
So if I can't walk on water, you couldn't either. So then this is another allegory. My eyes, my ears have you open. Water means truth. If I walk on the truth, oh, he raised the dead. Can you raise the dead? I can't either. Ever try that? Go in there. You ever go in his funeral parlors? <laughs> Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. He couldn't raise the dead either. What he did, he took those who were dead to wisdom, dead to enlightenment, dead to the spirit, and brought them out of the grave of their own flesh, and they rose up and they began to understand. They began to live. They began to stand on their feet. They became individuals. He separated them from the mob of religion and said, here, have life, live. Yes, you can do it. And that's exactly what he meant. The things that I do, you can do, you can do better than me. And take him up on it. He knew what he was talking about. And he's the kind of guy you can follow. So... Easter. It's okay. I don't have any problem with it. Go out and have a nice day today. Flowers are nice. I have any. As long as you get your head screwed on straight. Knowing that that day is a day to have fun. You want to celebrate the birds and the robins coming back and the flowers. Have a good time. Nothing wrong with that. Candies. We spent three hours looking for Joan for those little yellow marshmallow chicks. Couldn't find any. Nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But you know what? Unless you begin to understand Passover, you're never, ever going to make it. Because you're never going to realize that you've got to pass over from one part of your nature to the new part of your nature. And that the energy that comes, comes from the solar plexus or the place of the sun within you. That you've got to make that rise through your meditation and impact on the land, which is the pineal gland of the brain. Then move to the right side. When you understand Passover, you'll begin to live. Your children will begin to live. The world will begin to live. You can go through this all day idolizing some guy that got killed and resurrected, and that's not going to get you 10 cents. But once you understand Passover, then you'll understand life and you'll understand the world. The inside of you will become as the outside in our universe. And where you had winter, you'll start to have spring. Where you had ice and snow, you'll start to have warmth and flowers. And the sun will move up into the north. And the energy will wake all that has been asleep. And the egg that has held you tightly in the bondage of religion and tradition will suddenly start to crack. And you'll step out of it. And you'll be an individual. And you'll be special. And you realize what Jesus meant when he said, the kingdom of God is within you. And you are the light of the world. I talked a lot about the pineal gland of the brain. Because that's Aries the lamb. <clears throat> I just wanted to show you this. I'm done. I just wanted to show you this one thing. You open to Genesis chapter 32. Somebody yell it. Tell me what page Genesis chapter 32 is on. 29 is what you Okay, page 29. This is Jacob. Remember I told you about the pineal gland of the brain. There's a few folks that maybe haven't heard this before. You should see it. You have in your brain a thing called the pineal gland. That's where the energy rises. That's the same thing as Aries. When the sun